Let's pray. Father, we are able to approach you because you have made a determination that our sin would be covered by another, by the son of David. And we say thank you for that. We who are your people here, and certainly in, in the room, those who will hear this message, some, some are not, I, I'm sure, but Lord, most of us are. And so we who are your people say, thank you for covering our sin with the blood of your Son and welcoming us into your presence where we can ask you for grace and mercy to help us in our time of need. And now is one of those times. Because we have before us a text that is very familiar and is easily approached in a certain way and, and overlooked kind of like watching a train wreck, we think it's amazing and it's about somebody else. Lord, it's it's a disaster that also has a message for each of us in it, whether we're Christians or not yet Christians. There's something here for us to see, and I pray that you would give grace and mercy, that you would help us in our fallenness to see here to see you here, to see your word here. I pray that you would overcome our innate blindness and deafness. Help us to see and hear. And I pray that you would reach into us and wherever we are, that you would speak and draw us to you. So towards that end, Lord, I ask you for, for grace to make my words clear, to make them clear in my mind and to help me express them accurately so that they can speak the truth carried along by your Spirit into the hearts of people here and produce the change that you desire. It would all be of you, and so we will praise you for it. In advance, in faith, we say thank you for your work and your word. Thank you for building a people. Thank you for exalting your own name. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come and your will be done here among us. That's our hope and our request of you this morning. So do it, Father, please. By your Spirit, we pray. Build your church, honor your name. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. We turn our attention this morning to 2 Samuel chapter 12, where we continue on with the account begun last week in chapter 11. The account of David's shocking, sad collapse into sin. We use his power, we saw, to take for himself the wife of Uriah the Hittite. It is, it's shocking, not because it's sin, the, the kind of sin is, that we see here is common, but it's shocking because it's David. He's perhaps the person we would least expect to be like this, riding high as he has been, enjoying the grace and the goodness of God, brought to the throne and established. Everything's going wonderfully for him, and then he collapses. We saw this last week, and we saw at the end that God saw it and called it evil. That's the focus. And all of our attention in this passage, in 11 and in 12, all of our attention is drawn to David. Drawn to David and his sin. We, we do get Uriah depicted for us as, as a loyal soldier, as a the one who's faithful to the Lord, we get that there, but not so that we can understand Uriah, but as a contrast to understand the depth of David's sin. It's not really to explain Uriah to us. Nor is there anything in the passage that helps us understand Bathsheba. Not last week, nor this week. There isn't anything that helps us explore Joab and how he felt about being made an accomplice to murder. There's nothing this week about how the, the various wives of David felt, or how, how the judgment against David impacted them, though surely it did. Lots of questions. All of them are skipped because they're not the point. The point is to focus our attention on David and David's sin before the Lord, grievous that it is, to see the consequences of it, and to see that, amazingly, the steadfast love and grace of God remains on him. Amazing. So we look at sin and consequence, and particularly grace, this morning. 
That's what we're going to consider. I'm going to read all of chapter 12. A long chapter, but it's, it's the rest of the story. But we're only going to deal with the first 15 or 14 and a half verses this morning. Then we'll pick up again next week. So I'm going to read all of it, and then we'll focus on 1 to 15. I'll pass back through it to make sure that we understand some details, and there are some details to understand. And then we'll pull out a couple of main observations. So let me read, beginning in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 1. And the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, There were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. And he brought it up, and it grew up with him and with his children. It used to eat of his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guest who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. He said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul, and I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your arms, and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if this were too little, I would add to you as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this son. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child who is born to you shall die. Then Nathan went to his house. And the Lord afflicted the child that Uriah's wife bore to David, and he became sick. And David therefore sought God on behalf of the child. And David fasted and went in and lay all night on the ground. And the elders of his house stood beside him to raise him from the ground, but he would not, nor did he eat food with them. On the seventh day, the child died. And the servants of David were afraid to tell him that the child was dead, for they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, we spoke to him, and he did not listen to us. How then can we say to him, the child is dead? He may do, do himself some harm. But when David saw that his servants were whispering together, David understood that the child was dead. And David said to his servants, is the child dead? They said, he is dead. Then David rose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his clothes. And he went into the house of the Lord and worshiped. He then went to his own house. When he asked, they set food before him, and he ate. And his servants said to him, What is this thing that you have done? You fasted and wept for the child while he was alive, but when the child died, you arose and ate food. He said, While the child was still alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, Who knows whether the Lord will be gracious to me, that the child may live. But now he's dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he will not return to me. Then David comforted his wife Bathsheba and went into her and lay with her, and she bore a son, and he called his name Solomon. And the Lord loved him and sent a message by Nathan the prophet, so he called his name Jedidiah because of the Lord. Now Joab fought against Rabbah of the Ammonites and took the royal city. 
Joab sent messengers to David and said, I have fought against Rabbah. Moreover, I have taken the city of waters. Now then, gather the rest of the people together and encamp against the city and take it, lest I take the city and it be called by my name. So David gathered all the people together and went to Rabbah and fought against it and took it. And he took the crown of their king from his head. The weight of it was a talent of gold, and in it was a precious stone, and it was placed on David's head. And he brought out the spoil of the city, a very great amount. And he brought out the people who were in it and set them to labor with saws and iron picks and iron axes and made them toil at the brick kilns. And thus he did do all the cities of the Ammonites. Then David and all the people returned to Jerusalem. The word of the Lord, chapter 12. In the original language, the first word of this chapter is the word sent. We saw this word all throughout chapter 11 with much sending. Many people were sending messengers and sending messages and in so doing exerting control over the situation, David in particular, sending and sending and making things happen. And all the while it appears the Lord is not present until at the very end of the chapter he steps in, renders a verdict, and then the pinnacle of the story, chapter 12, verse 1, the Lord decides to send and he sends a prophet, Nathan. Many months have passed here. Either the child has already been born or is about to be born. So we're nine plus months after this event. It's all kind of died down in the past. And the prophet comes, apparently, seeking legal advice. David is the chief justice of the the land of Israel, and so he has a question for him, kind of wants his advice on a case. There are two men in a city, one rich, but let's talk about the poor one. He had nothing, except... He had this one little female lamb. And he'd bought this lamb and it had grown up with him, with his children, been very dear to them. He'd he'd, he'd eaten with this lamb in their home, in fact. And they'd they'd given the lamb drinks out of their cup and held it in their arms, held it close to them. They were dear, like a daughter, like a bat. In Hebrew, the word for daughter is bat, the first syllable of Batsheba a dear little female bot to him. And the rich man, who had plenty of lambs, took this dear little bot, because he didn't want to take one of his own lambs. He took it, slit its throat, cut it open, ripped out its entrails, roasted it on the fire, and ate it. That's what Nathan communicates. And David is appalled. This dear, precious little female daughter. Eaten. The man who did this should die. And you should give back fourfold. That's, that's the stipulation of the law. If you take something, you don't just give one back and call it good. You, you fourfold replace it as a deterrent against such things. David is incensed by it. As the Lord lives, the man who did such a thing deserves to die. Literally, he's a son of death. He sees it clearly, this man and his sin, and is angered by it. And then, Dave, and then Nathan just presses it just a little bit further, presses it home. We're talking about you. Now, in my Bible, there's an exclamation point there. We, we don't know. We don't get this, the sense of the, the atmosphere there. I think it is just as likely that Nathan whispered. Because he's already had the verdict come out of, out of David's mouth. And as we work through the story, David is, is broken by this. He doesn't need to be battering through defenses with, with a charge, with a thundering prophetic pronouncement. I, th- I think he probably whispered. But either way, he connects the last dots. You are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. Nathan now recounts the past grace of God to him, which, which has been great grace. I anointed you king. Emphasis on I. I did this, not you. I anointed you king. And I gave you the throne. I gave you everything in Saul's house. I gave you Saul's wives. We'll come back to that in a minute. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. I gave you everything you could dream of. And that had not been enough, I would have given you even more. He's layering on 
everything that I have done. I anointed you king and protected you and brought you to the kingdom and gave you everything, David. And as an aside, if, if the giving of wives causes you a little pause or makes you think, how's God giving multiple wives to David? Does that make him in favor of polygamy or something? Consider it in its context. Context of the Bible is extremely clear how God feels about multiple wives and concubines and royal harems. He's against them. Both from the, the principle from Genesis 2 of one man, one woman marriage and specific commandments like in Deuteronomy 17 that the king should not have many wives or New Testament commandments about how the leaders of the church that are representatives of what people should be should be the husband of one wife. Really clear in the Bible what God thinks about one woman, one man. And it's also really clear in the Bible and clear in the context of the culture that people sin. Sin happens. So what we're seeing here is, is nothing more than a given sin. Now what? Given that, though I have said people and kings in general should not have many wives, given that they do, anyway... And that that harem, the wives and concubines of a king, become part of the property of the royal household. Given that, when I give you the royal household, David, I give you these wives too, unavoidably so. They don't just cease to exist. They don't belong to somebody else. They don't just go out onto the street and become destitute. They are part of the royal household, so I give them to you. The point being, the point he's driving home here, David you have more wives than you can keep track of. Not that that's right, but that's true. You have more wives yourself than you can keep track of, and yet you went and you took somebody else's wife. You took the poor man's one and only and took it to yourself, which is a great sin against Uriah, of course. But the focus, again, is drawing back to David and God. I gave... I anointed you. I set you up. Why? The question, verse 9. Why on earth? You'd think that David of all people would be one most inclined to follow God and trust Him and obey Him. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in His sight? Which is clarified in verse 10. Why have you despised me? To despise the word of the Lord is to despise the Lord. Why have you despised me? striking down Uriah and taking his wife. And therefore, thus says the judge of all the earth, here's the consequence. In keeping with the spirit of the law, you brought the sword out of your house, the sword will be in your house. He's talking about the rest of this book that is full of strife and trouble and conflict and civil war. You took a wife, therefore I will take your wives. What you did in secret will be done in public to your humiliation. Everyone will know it. It's the word of the Lord to David. David's response to it is simple and straightforward. I have sinned against the Lord. To which Nathan then also responds simply and straightforwardly. Well, the Lord has taken away your sin and you shall not die. But because of this deed that you've done, and some translations mention enemies here, Point being that God has been scorned because of what David has done. Because you have caused my name to be scorned, the child will die. Which again, we need to be clear about, clear to understand this. He is not condemning the child in David's stead. We've talked about this before, but... Very briefly, the Bible gives us very good reason to believe that when God takes the life of a baby, as he does here, he's not judging the baby and not condemning the baby, but he takes the baby to be with himself in his presence. It's a larger discussion than I have time for now. But we should not read this and, and worry about what happens to the baby. It goes into the presence of the Lord and enjoys him forever. This is a, a judgment against David, an affliction against David where the focus stays all along. Now we stop there for this morning. Obviously, there's much more to come. But this far through the chapter, I 
think there's an important main point brought out to us here that I'm going to sum up like this in this sentence. God sees and meets us in our sin with the grace of affliction and forgiveness. Let me say that again. God sees and meets us in our sin with the grace of affliction and forgiveness. And those two things, the affliction and the forgiveness, are going to form the two observations that I'm going to make now and unpack this a little further. My first observation, God meets us in our sin with the grace of affliction. He meets us with the grace of affliction. The Lord sees all the evil in the world all the evil done by all of his creation, all by people, and he calls it what it is, evil. This is the righteous judge over all the earth. He sees it for what it is and calls it accurately, breaking of his law, evil. Verse 9, we see it with David here. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? It is evil. You did it, David. You murdered Uriah, stole his wife, committed adultery, all because you coveted the possession of your neighbor, and then you bore false witness about it at the moment, and then for months afterwards. If you're keeping track, that's five of the Ten Commandments. Evil. With David, the dearly beloved one, God calls it what it is. It is evil. It is sin. And he meets it with affliction, eventually. Now, it took a bunch of months here. This, as we've noticed, it's nine months or so. The baby is about to be born if it hasn't already been born. It took a little while, but he eventually meets it with affliction. And it's the affliction that comes is because of the sin. Verse 10, now, now therefore, this is a specific consequence. Now therefore, because of this, I will bring the sword to you and I will cast out your wives. Affliction. God brings it upon sinful David and he does that with all of us. We need to stop here. This, this is the part where we got to stop and think. He does that with all of us. He didn't overlook David. He won't overlook us. God tells us in his word that we should be wise and not be deceived. God is not mocked. We reap what we sow. The idea here is that God does not look down at his world as, as an impotent grandfather who would love for things to be one way and sees them another way and says, man, okay, I mean, I guess I can't do anything about that. No. Reigns over the earth, intervenes in it, and meets us in our sin with affliction. Now, very carefully... God is not mechanical, that, that this always leads to that. And so we, we always see immediately cause and effect. We always see the affliction that follows on the heels of the sin. We always see, I reap that, I, I sow that, I reap this. We don't always see the connection. Sometimes it takes many months, many years. Sometimes the affliction that comes is very directly, very obviously connected. Sometimes you don't even realize you're being afflicted as you kind of muddle through life with, with an emotional hole left in you never knowing quite where that came from, never able to connect it back to the sin. So the point is, even if you don't see it right now, and even if you can't see all the ways that it works out, God meets sin. God meets people in their sin with affliction. He met David very clearly, very overtly, in a very devastating way. But he meets all of us in our sin, with affliction. But, I'm calling it here, the language I'm using is the grace of affliction. Which we need to think about for a second. Because on first pass, that almost seems like a contradiction. The grace of affliction, it's like good pain helpful adversity. 
these things, these things seem like contradictions, perhaps, especially if you're thinking of God meeting sin like this, to blast you, angry, vengeful. He meets us with the grace of affliction. How can that be? Well, let's keep thinking here. If you look at this passage, what is the greatest problem in David here? It is not his adultery. It is not his murder. It is not his deception. Not any of those things. On the surface there, the greatest problem is where God's pronouncement against him rests. Verse 9 and verse 10. You despised the word of the Lord. You despised me and therefore did these other things. Those other things are serious. They're they're sin, but they are symptomatic of of a deeper, more fundamental problem. A despising of the Lord. You despised me, that is, you relegated me to some place beneath my rightful place. To despise the Lord, to denigrate him, to cast him off, to ignore him, to discard him. This one who pours out all of the grace you can imagine needing, every good thing I gave you, I gave, I, I, I did this, and you set me aside, rejected me, discarded me moved on from me, despised me. This one, this men and women, this must grab you. Do not let this remain theory. There is a God who is good. And it's the only good. And we should speak of this with earnestness. Good. And to say, get out of my life. (laughs) Yeah, that's evil. Uh, Tragic. I know better than you, all wise. I'm stronger than you, all powerful. I'm better than you, all good. Out! I reject you and set off down my own course to make a life. That is infinitely more important than a little bit of murder. Hopefully the stupidity of that statement strikes you. That's why I say it like that. Then then a little bit of murder, a little bit of adultery. We think that's the big problem. If he just hadn't have killed Uriah or hadn't have taken Bathsheba, then it'd be okay. No, that came from something else that was there before. You despised me and then saw her and took her and then stuck, killed him. This started somewhere else. In tragedy, A despising of this one who is good. This thrusting out of your life, the only one who has ever done anything for you, David, me. And any action that God would take to fix that, to to reverse the despising, to reestablish in the center of David's thinking and looking and loving and feeling, to center God again right there in front of him, anything that God would do to do that would be wonderful. Would be wonderful. Grace. That's what he's after in the affliction. He's not after striking a blow because he's angry at him. And he pursues us and meets us in our sin with affliction. It is not to get you. If you're a Christian, he already got Christ for that. If you're not a Christian, He will get you at the judgment for that. He gets somebody for that. And he meets you in affliction right now. It's to get you in a different way. It's to get you back. To turn you back to him. 
to raise before you the depth of the severity of despising him. This one who is life. David has rejected him. Men and women, we live, we walk consistently despising him. All I can do now is alert you to that. To raise it in front of you and, and say, do not be surprised or worse yet resentful or angry if God meets you in your sin with affliction. It is a gracious work. In fact, all of affliction in life. We're talking here that obviously here affliction comes to David and so I'm talking about affliction that comes to us because of our sin but all of affliction in life. Affliction that comes to us because of somebody else's sin or affliction that is not tied to sin directly at all. All of affliction in life is meant by God as a grace to us to turn us back to him. All of it. Do not be surprised at it or resentful or angry. But take it and receive it. And take what it means to be from the hand of a good and loving God to you. A turn, a pull. He is not a parent who is, who is timid about disciplining. He's, he's not a father who... Disciplines irregularly, sometimes when he feels like it, sometimes towards good directions, but sometimes not. Always he's disciplining towards good to pull us back to him. Take it as that, receive it as that, and turn. The Bible word there is repent. To turn to him. So as he's speaking to you now, calling you to turn to repent, perhaps speaking to you in affliction. I don't know. I don't know what's going on in your life. Maybe he will later today, with this ringing in your ears, or tomorrow or next week. Affliction, perhaps it might be something intense or, or very clear. Perhaps it might just be the emptiness in your heart. You're wondering, why do I not find rest? He's afflicting you. He's not letting you sleep until you come and find rest where rest is to be found. May he afflict you until, you until you meet him. So he meets us in, in our sin with gracious affliction. Affliction designed to deal with our despising, to recenter us on him, to turn us back to him, to win us allegiance, which is what we need, what we're made for. That is a good thing. He meets us in our sin with gracious affliction. But that's not it. It's not all. There is more. And we begin to notice the second point. If you look and see, there's another affliction in the passage. He even uses the word in verse 15. The Lord afflicted the child. There's another affliction here. As a consequence of David's sin, he afflicts the newborn. Maybe to add to the public testimony about the gravity of sin, probably in line with what I was just talking about here, but I think there's something a little bit more here. Underlines something marvelous, I think, which we'll see in the second observation. So God meets us in our sin with the grace of affliction. And just judging by the amount of text that appears to be the dominant point, there are a lot of words given to, to describing that, but it's not actually the main point. Here's the second observation. God meets us in our sin with the grace of forgiving release. God meets us in our sin with the grace of forgiving release. I mentioned the baby in verse 14, but I need to hold that and work towards it. We'll start back at the beginning. In talking about God meeting us with the sin of forgiving release, we actually start back in verse 1, 
and really even before that in the last verse of the previous chapter. God sees the sin. God calls it evil. God sees David's despising of him. We read that, as we said last week, we realize, wow, David is a lot more like Saul than we thought, despising the word of the Lord. And when Saul despised the word of the Lord, God sent a prophet to Saul, Samuel, with a message. What was the message? You're done. And I've raised up another one to be king. But in verse 1, here, when the Lord steps forward and begins to move and finally sends, he sends the prophet Nathan with a different message and a different goal. The goal of drawing David out and drawing David back. To paraphrase the, the remarks of one commentator I read, I think this puts it well, God is so gracious with David that Nathan's convicting sword is an inch from his conscience before David realizes that he even has a sword. God comes at him so well to be sure that he gets him. He brings it up in the story. David is exposed, feels the horror of his sin, feels it in his heart. And as he recounts all of the past grace of God, and it's been great, vast, past grace, raising him up as king and protecting him and bringing him to the throne. David knows what should be next. He, he announces the, the grace of and he announces the sin, and he announces the punishment of the sword and the wives, and David knows what is supposed to be next. It just came off of his own lips two minutes ago. The law condemns adultery with death. He knows that should be coming, and before that comes, he says, I have sinned against the Lord. David is broken by this. David sees it all, and he spoke it all, he gets it, and he has not yet been released from it. He stands before the prophet of God who's confronting him in his sin and says, with the sentence still hanging right in front of him, I'm guilty. I deserve it. He's undone and completely vulnerable. This is someone in court who's on the witness stand and says, I did it. And then, afterwards, not before, afterwards, the judge through Nathan says, God has put away your sin and you will not die. Put it away? Put, put it where? Doesn't say. You will not die. Does say that. Though you should, you will not die, but your son David will die, though he shouldn't. I've put away your sin, David. You won't die, but your son David will. That should make us think about something. There's a big hole left here. There's, there's a hole in the, the righteousness of God that would be exploited by a critic. Where does God get off putting away David's sin and just letting it go? He can't do that. This, this is the point where the accuser, the, the, the attorney for the prosecution, would stand up and say, whoa, 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 that's not the law. You can't do that, judge. You can't say, well, never mind. You don't have the right. Where does it go? It doesn't say here. There's a great big hole, a gap left here. What are the righteousness of God? Well, the answer comes later when another son of David, born in the line of Bathsheba, another son who did not deserve to die, nonetheless was afflicted. Transgression by others was poured on him, and he was crushed for the iniquity of others, though he did not deserve it, was pure and righteous in his own person, 
nonetheless died. The son of David, born in the line of Bathsheba. Who are we talking about? Jesus. Now, in this passage, there is not a direct substitution. As I said already, the baby is not condemned in the place of David. No one's condemned here. There's a marker of condemnation put on the table that's going to be picked up later and put on the cross. But there's a, there's a, a pattern laid out here for us. Not David, but the son of David dies. There's a pattern laid out for us that points us towards something. Our goal here is not to hunt through the Old Testament passages and find the gospel there so that we can say, I found the gospel there. Our goal is to look at the Old Testament passages and say, look what God's doing. God bothers to come to David so as to pull David all the way to the end. I have sinned and in his repentance broken before God to pronounce on him release, forgiveness. And we say, how? In the gospel. God's drawing David to the gospel. God's drawing you to the gospel. God wants you to read this passage and say, I am guilty. Oh my word. Despising of the Lord is what I breathe and eat. Oh my word. May God bring that to you. May he be so clever as to sneak up on you and stab you from the back. May he confront you and batter down the front gates. However he needs to bring it to you, may he convince you in your mind, that man is me. I am one who despises the Lord. It is you. It is not David. It is not somebody else. It is not them out there. It is you. And broken and convinced of that, you despise the Lord who does all good to you. May that weigh on you and, oh, I am guilty. And then he's put away your sin. Away. Gone. Unto someone else who will die instead. Because you caused the Lord to be scorned. This is the gospel. You do not die for your sin. All you who are weary and heavy laden and come to him broken and humble, repentant. Oh my God, I am guilty. I have sinned against the Lord. Uriah and Bathsheba, sure. But against the Lord. Do not play the part of Saul. What was she doing on the roof naked anyway? She should have said no. This, this is what Saul does when he's confronted with the word of the Lord, right? And what we do. If Uriah had just listened to what I said and gone home, he'd be alive. Dodging and bobbing and weaving. May God bring home to you your sin in all of its evilness. That's who you are. And you must be there oh, if you're going to be in the next verse. Released. He has taken it away from you. Gone. Released from the guilt of the penalty of sin, you will not die. And as we see moving on to next week, released even from the, the internal burden of sin. That's what, a little, a little bit of preview next week, that's what befuddles the servants. They're not thinking like one who knows God. David, you should be just all torn up about this. And how can you, how can you respond like this to God? And, he says, because I was praying that maybe God would show me grace and actually not kill the child. That doesn't make any sense to anybody. 
If you're thinking that God is going to blast him, then of course he's going to blast you. But he's thinking, no, he's a God of grace, and he forgave me, he removed my sin off of me. I'm free now to come into his presence and ask him for grace and mercy in my time of need. I have a need right now, my son's sick. I'll ask. And he says, no, okay. Let's worship and eat and go into Bathsheba again. That's mind-boggling, unless you understand release from guilt and release from condemnation. It is a marvelous thing. God meets us in our sin with the grace of forgiving release. He will meet you in your sin with the grace of forgiving release. All you who are weary and heavy laden and come to him repentant. That's me. I'm a sinner. So obviously, if you're not a Christian, this is crying out to you to repent for your sin, to believe and be saved, released from guilt. Guilt is a good thing. Guilt is one of those gracious afflictions. The world out there tries to tell you not to feel guilty about anything. No, you should feel guilty. You're guilty. Sin is wrong. You should feel guilty. And the feeling of guilt is a grace from God to alert you to a problem. Kind of like pain in our bodies alerts us. Something's not right here. It hurts. That's a really good thing. Respond to that by saying, sinner that I am, God, forgive me, please, because of the cross. And he will. But Christian, realize that this passage is mainly about a believer dealing with sin as a believer. That's who David is. So primarily, we are the main target here. We who are believers are the main target. Our sin, our despising of the Lord is the main focus here. Confess and repent, Christian. Is God stalking you, afflicting you graciously, making you uncomfortable, maybe bringing hardship into your life? Is he in some way after you to bring you before him surrendered so as to release you? Psalm 51, you know Psalm 51. It's a, a great psalm that talks about God restoring to David the joy of his salvation. Perhaps God wants to restore to you the joy of your salvation. Not to save you, to restore to you the joy of that salvation that comes after this. Repent for your joy, then. David elsewhere talks about how his, his bones were wasting away while he was burdened under this sin. This was nine months of smiling on the outside and knowing what he did on the inside. Wasting away. And God released him from it. Repent for your relief. What a good God who works to meet us in our sin with grace that afflicts us to turn to him and then grace that forgives us and releases us. A marvelous, good God. Come to him. All you who are weary and heavy laden and he'll give you rest. Let me pray. God Almighty, we are a people in need of your kind hand. The hand to afflict and discipline and turn. And the hand to grab our burdens, pick them up and throw them away. Releasing us from carrying them. We are in need of your hand, Lord. And so I pray... Reach out your hand towards your people here, wherever they are, whatever they need. Meet them, graciously pursue them like you graciously pursued David. 
wisely, cleverly, subtly, clearly, powerfully, painfully, but graciously. Pursue your people in like manner. And Lord, I want to also ask you to chase down those who are not your people here, but who have heard of you. And Lord, give them a sense of their guilt and a sense of the only release for it, you. Awaken and stir and call and save, please, Lord, we ask you. Honor your name. Honor the name of the Lord Jesus. Build your church. Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thank you, Lord. Amen.